Hello there. Welcome to Just the Discs. We talk about Blu-rays here and 4Ks, and that is the topic of conversation for this round. Actually, very exciting. Um, I've got two movies to talk about. Both are Criterion. Both are 4Ks. One is an upgrade, and one has never been even on Blu-ray before, as far as I know. And um, both are favorites. One is a real, real big favorite. Uh, but let me get into this. Uh, this is an exciting time. Uh, last year was great in terms of getting some favorites on Blu-ray and 4K, like After Hours, Real Bravo, all that stuff. Um, I'm going to start with Lone Star from Criterion. This is a big one for me. It was a very important film at a time when I was really going all in on movies because it came out in 1996 and I had already started to study film at my university and I've sort of fully committed to movies like this is what I want to study maybe make you know I don't know but I was working at a video store of course I've talked about that but this one let me back up so basically like 1994, Pulp Fiction comes out, and it was such a, you know, incredible force in my life. I was just so blown away by it, and it got me so excited about movies and filmmaking and, you know, maybe being a filmmaker, whatever. <clears throat> so every year after that, I was like, okay, what's this year's Pulp Fiction or what's a movie that is going to be one of my favorites of the year that I'm going to want to share with people. And I don't have necessarily a memory of each one, like from 95, 96, like Rushmore was another one in like 98. That was just like a defining kind of movie. And Lone Star was like that for me in 1996. So it's only a couple years after Pulp Fiction. And again, it's not, if you watch the movie, it's not like Pulp Fiction almost at all. It's a totally different kind of thing. John Sayles is a very different kind of filmmaker, but that said, it was as impactful to me almost as Pulp Fiction because I just loved it so much. And I was sort of getting into John Sayles around that time. Um, he was, I mean, he was certainly, <clears throat> you know, he a ways into his career. He had been making movies since like 1979 when he made Return of the Seacock of Seven, and he was, and is, uh, a force in independent filmmaking. Like, a guy who, you know, did some movies that, like, Baby It's You came out through Paramount, but I don't know the particulars of that deal. Like, you know, he, so he worked with studios occasionally, but mostly he made his own stuff. And he was a writer-director and, you know, did screenplays for Roger Corman, like Piranha and uh, Alligator and... Lady in Red and things like that. And um, so I knew of him and I, I was getting into the, I think I remember this now, like, so I was getting into the Corman stuff, like Rock and Roll High School was a huge one for me in the mid 90s because it was hard to see <clears throat> and you had to track down like a big old clamshell VHS. Sorry for all this backstory. Um, but anyway, so then I started looking into like, those movies and you come across John Sayles and you're like, oh, wait a minute, this guy was a filmmaker in his own right. I've never seen Return of the Seacock of Seven. I've never seen Leanna. I've never seen Baby It's You, which ended up being one of my favorite movies. <clears throat> and um, so I started to really get into John Sayles and this comes out at the local art house theater and I went to see it and it blew me away. I just absolutely loved it. And I think I took... My girlfriend at the time, I think I took my friend, like I must have seen it at least two times, maybe three in the theater, which I don't, I don't usually do that. Um, but anyway, it was a big deal in 96 and it has not been on Blu-ray uh, to this point. And so it was really a long time coming and I do love it. This new trend of movies leapfrogging past Blu-ray to 4K, like After Hours last year. Um, that's a really great win for, you know, folks like us who love these movies. So <clears throat> very exciting to get this on 4K and Blu-ray. And uh, it still leaves a few sales movies not on Blu-ray uh, that I want, like Brother from Another Planet, 
again, Return of the Seacock is seven, his first film, which was kind of a proto Big Chill before Big Chill. Uh, Limbo, very interesting movie that he did. Uh, that I don't think any of those have made it to Blu-ray yet, but this is a big one. This is a really big one, and it's very important in that sense. But the story is basically about a, a border town in Texas called Front Frontera that is a mix of Tejano, African American, Native American, and uh, Anglo folks. Uh, and so the Anglo folks are not the majority here. And they have a sheriff called Sam Deeds, played by the great Chris Cooper, in one of his sort of big breakout roles for me. Like, he had been in other movies. He'd been in sales movies like Mate One. But this is like, he has to carry this movie, and he really knocked me out as this guy. You know, kind of like a little sad, a little serious, um, but going through some stuff. And so you get where he's coming from actually coming off of a divorce you find out in the movie but anyway so we are dealing with this town of frontera in all its facets we are and and sales would do this you know multiple times these films about uh city government local government communities bureaucracy these are things he would approach in in other movies like city of hope sunshine state i'm a big fan of both of those definitely city of hope which is another one actually doesn't have a blu-ray now that i think about it i really want a city of hope blu-ray which by the way watch city of hope and it is 100 percent the proto wire it's like the for for the show the wire it's setting up the whole city you know it's it's a great i love that movie so anyway this movie is interesting because so it's dealing with uh, Frontera, Frontera as it is now, and some of the drama they go through in the you know local bureaucracy stuff. Uh, the mayor is played by the great Clifton James. He is a really wonderful character actor, and I love to see him in movies. And he's fantastic as this mayor that's you know kind of you're not really sure about, but like is a is a an interesting dude. So. The big thrust of the movie, though, is that at the beginning, a couple guys find a skeleton on an old military rifle range because one of the things that's part of this town is a big military army base, which is now headed up by Joe Morton, who's another, uh, he's the commanding officer there. He's another regular in sales films, and he's the star brother from another planet, and he's great, and I love Joe Morton. So that's a thing. So the guys find this skeleton on, uh, and they find a sheriff's badge and you come to find out that in 1957, I think there was an incident or there was something, there's a legend about Sam Deeds, father, Buddy Deeds, who was played by Matthew McConaughey in this movie. And Buddy Deeds was the sheriff then, or he was at the time he was actually a deputy. And there was a guy named big Charlie Wade, who was the sheriff and he's played by Chris Christopherson, who is really great in this movie. And Big Charlie Wade is a bigoted, awful, scary, you know, Southern sheriff. The kind of guy that you wouldn't want to get tangled up with because he'll throw you in jail or shoot you. uh, And that stuff comes up. And the idea was that Buddy Deeds and Charlie Wade uh, had beef with each other and that Charlie Wade disappeared. And so this new body might be Charlie Wade. We don't know. And Sam Deeds who has been hearing about his dad his whole life, obviously lived with his dad, is not sure about his dad, and maybe in part wants his dad to have done something so horrible as kill this other guy, uh, to sort of deflate this legend that surrounded him. Um, So we get these great scenes, and one of the things the film does so well is it has these flashbacks. And I guess Sales is saying that the idea is that we carry our history with us all the time. So what he'll do is he'll start in one space, let's say a cafe, and you'll have the mayor, Clifton James, telling a story about Buddy Deeds and Charlie Wade having a confrontation. He'll say it started over a basket of tortillas. And they'll start on Clifton James, they'll go over to the basket of tortillas, and then they'll come up in the same shot, and suddenly Chris Christopherson's there, and we're in 1957. And he does this sort of seamless, without a cut transition in and out of these flashbacks. 
at least three or four, maybe five times. And they're all great. And I love them. And I think it's such a neat thing. The only other movie I can think of that's done it is Dolores Claiborne, which is right around this time, actually, interestingly. Um, but there aren't a lot of movies that try to do this sort of seamless flashback idea. And it really works well in this movie. And it's one of the things I've always loved about it. But the other thing that's really neat about it is that Frontera is really like a microcosm of the United States itself and how lots of people are, you know, sort of living together and struggling to be heard, um, struggling to have their issues heard. And it's strangely, for a film for 1996, really relevant today because there is so much border politics and there's a lot of race stuff. There's even a scene like a school board meeting where people are complaining that Elizabeth Pena, who's one of the main characters, um, she's a school teacher and she and Sam Deeds sort of have a history, which I won't go into. Uh, she's being told by these parents like that she's teaching the wrong kind of history. You know, she's actually trying to contextualize some things that happened that, you know, are not necessarily true. And that's, you know, a big thing we're seeing now is people complaining about what they think is revisionist history, which is maybe actually more like real history. But it's it's really interesting to see that stuff and go, wow, this is a this is a, you know, almost 30 year old movie. And it's feels like now, I mean, except for the border looks totally different. There's no wall. It's completely different in that way. But yeah, so these are the players. You've got, you know, all these people together and these stories and there's some great father-son stuff with the Buddy Deeds, Sam Deeds thing. And then there's Joe Morton and his dad who runs a bar in town. And that, I don't want to go into all the characters because it is such a well-told story. And it's such a fascinating film to watch. And I think, I love the bureaucracy, city politics stuff, community stuff that Sales does. And he really does a great job. He has a very humanistic approach to character. Even less than likable characters he gives uh both a moment to ha have their say but also uh just kind of gives them a, a complex feeling that isn't so one note and i think that writing is obviously one of the great things about him and it's also maybe part of the problem with him not finding a home at studios because the, there's a great interview on this disc, and I'll talk about it in a second, but he talks about how you know he doesn't do a lot of work, work with studios, and he's like, it's kind of a mutually exclusive thing. And by that, I guess he means that they're, his movies aren't easily sold. And in that sense, I get it, because these characters are complex, and you can certainly make a trailer about these movies, but it's, it's just a different animal than a lot of films you'd see. And, it, and, it, and they end in less satisfying ways than maybe you'd want a certain Hollywood idea of an ending to be. And I love that about him. You know, I really do. But, it, but the characters are just so wonderful and he's great with casting. He does these wonderful ensemble casts that are just remarkable, you know, just uses a lot of great actors, some of which don't get used enough. Um, Joe Morton, for example, I just think is, you know, spectacular and really should be used a lot more than he is. And anyway, so I love this movie, and I can't tell you how much this rewatch really got me. Like, it affected me. The movie, you know, got me emotional. I think partially because I love it so much, and I hadn't watched it in a while because I was kind of holding out for a, a nice release of it. And this is like, you know, for me, it's like disc of the year material already in January. You know, I mean, it's got two features on it only, but they're both really good. And an incredible, beautiful transfer, this 4K scan... It's um, a new 4K digital restoration supervised by sales and director of photography, Stuart Dryberg. Uh, and it looks just gorgeous. Just these vistas. And they chose to, I'll talk about that in, in the Stuart Dryberg interview section, but they chose to shoot in CinemaScope and widescreen and that serves the movie really well. So anyway, really, really great film. I absolutely adore it. And uh, I just can't, say enough good things about it. There's even a bit part for Francis McDormand in here that's that's interesting. Um, so what do we have in terms of the features? Well, first let me just say we've got a little booklet here. So you have your two discs. You have your 4K and your Blu-ray. 4K doesn't have anything. The Blu-ray has both the features. Um, 
The uh, essay included is by uh, Domino Rene Perez. And um, I'm just going to read the beginning paragraph of it here. Early in John Sales' Lone Star, a panoramic drama set on the Texas border with Mexico. The film visits a parent-teacher meeting already in heated progress, framed against an oversized roller map of Texas. An Anglo parent pr protests that the school is tearing everything down, tearing down our heritage, tearing down the memory of people who fought and died for this land. The parents and teachers... Uh, gathered in the classroom include both Anglo and Mex of Anglo and Mexican descent, and it is the latter part of the population that constitutes the majority of the film's fictional setting of Frontera. So it's, um, you know, mostly Mexican uh, folks that live in this this town. Um, let's see here. Uh, but the hour in the parents' objection clearly refers to Anglo Texans. As the argument escalates, one of the teachers herself, Anglo, uh, replies that their goal as educators is to, quote, present a more complete picture of their border community. The complaining woman erupts, and that's what's got to stop. So I think that's an interesting start to that essay. Um, and, and that scene is, like I said, very timely, very interesting. And I'm sure part of the reason Criterion puts these movies out is they look at it something and they go, this seems like a good time for this. Um, so anyway, uh, special features. Really great conversation between John Sales and Gregory Nava, who's another filmmaker. Um, and he made the film El Norte in 1983, among others. But it's a great chat because, A, Gregory Nava, uh, I believe a Mexican-American filmmaker, um, also an independent filmmaker, a contemporary of John Sales. Sales is making uh, Return of the Seacock of 7 in 79, and Nava is making El Norte in 83. And so they're really close together. I mean, he's in this con the conversation with guys like Spike Lee, and they they mention Wayne Wang, Joan Micklin Silver. I would throw um, Jim Jarmusch in there. I mean, he's doing stuff, you know, eighty four, around this time. Um, but these are guys who like to tell stories that fall outside of the Hollywood system, you know. But they still need to be told, and. So it's just a really neat conversation about, you know, approach to independent filmmaking, um, these kind of special stories. Uh, Sales talks about, like, one of the seeds for Lone Star being when he was, uh, when he sold the script to Piranha and had a cameo in that film. Apparently there was a drought in California, so they couldn't shoot... Um, some of the Piranha Lake stuff, they had to go to Texas to shoot it, is what he's saying. And so he went to Texas, and he wasn't that far from the Alamo, and he'd never been, so he took a bus, went to the Alamo, and when he got there, um, there was a big picture of the from the movie The Alamo, where you have John Wayne, Richard Widmark, and Lawrence Harvey on like this big poster inside. And apparently there were people protesting um, saying, tell the real story. And Sales immediately was drawn to the idea of the protesting over the real history. And so that's like circa 78, 79. And this, so this story had been gestating with him for a long time. Um, yeah, so it's great. They talk about the, the connection between the present and the past and how these characters are carrying history around with them. Um, he talks about how, uh, he does his films, you know, how he writes little bios for each character, how he doesn't do rehearsals because he wants that first take energy. Um, he says he has overriding thematics about like, when we say we, how big is we, you know, like as a group of whatever, you know, white people or whatever you want to talk about. Uh, what is this we? And I think that that is an interesting thing because you look at his movies and there is a lot of, we, but like, who is he talking about? Is it a city? Is it a, whatever? So I love that idea too. So it's a really great conversation. It's about 38 minutes long and I really enjoyed it. And, um, I like these, I would love a commentary from sales, but there was a lot of great stuff that came out in this chat and I, and I dug it. Um, the other thing is a Stuart Dryberg interview. He's the DP of the film. It's about an 18 minute con uh, interview. And previous to this Dryberg, 
had shot uh, the piano and I think Angel at My Table for Jane Campion and then Once Were Warriors for Lee Tamahori. And I guess Sales had previously worked with Haskell Wexler, but uh, Haskell, wasn't, Haskell wasn't available, so they decided... I, I don't know if they saw Once Were Warriors. Was it Sundance or something? I can't remember what he said, but I think they reached out to him and Dryberg was like, you know, when he got the call, he's like, I don't even need to re- read the script. I would love to work with him. And, um, yeah, so it's great. I mean, Haskell Wexler shot Mate Wan, Secret of Ron Inish, and some stuff after that. But I really love the collaboration here, and they did a great job. Um, he talks about it being his first widescreen scope movie and that he and Sales both agreed in the tradition of the Western and that wide open spaces. It seemed like a no-brainer to shoot in scope. And they used Panavision cameras and lenses, and it was useful to them to look at Sergio Leone Westerns in terms of how to compose for this extended wide frame. Once Upon a Time in the West was a particular touchstone, apparently. And um, they lifted shots straight from that movie, I guess. Uh, and he talks about how you do a Dutch angle on this in this widescreen version, and, and it adds this air of mystery or Hitchcockiness or something. Um, he talks about how they shot some of the flashback scenes. He talks about the set vibe. It's really a neat, neat interview, and I really enjoyed it. Um, so overall, A+. Plus, absolutely love this movie and this release from Criterion. Fantastic. That's Lone Star. Now... I'll be a little quicker on this one, but another big upgrade we just got is Blood Simple. And this is, uh, of course, the Coen Brothers debut film from 1984. I don't know if I'd throw the Coen Brothers in with that other group, but they are obviously making this film completely independently. Uh, And it's an interesting unintended Texas double bill that I didn't even realize I was going to be doing. Um, And this movie is a really incredible calling card of a neo-noir that the Coen Brothers came up with to help launch their career and they really did a really spectacular job with it. Um, it was shot by Barry Sonnenfeld who they would go back to again for other films, including raising Arizona, which has just got some crazy awesome camera work in it. This is very stylish. It is fascinating to me that it was the first 35 millimeter film that Barry Sonnenfeld ever shot because it has some really cool tracking stuff. I'll talk about that in a second, but basically what does the back say? Joel and Ethan Cohen's career-long, darkly conk road trip through misfit America began with this razor-sharp, hard-boiled neo-noir set somewhere in Texas where a sleazy bar owner releases a torrent of violence with one murderous thought. Actor M. Emmett Walsh looms over the proceedings as a slippery private eye with a yellow suit, a cowboy hat, and no moral compass, and Frances McDormand's cunning debut uh, performance set her on the road to stardom. The tight scripting and inventive style that have marked the Coen's work for decades are all here in their first film in which cinematographer Barry Sonnenfeld abandons black and white um, for neon signs and jukebox colors that combine with Carter Burwell's haunting score uh, to lurid and thrilling effect, blending elements from Pulp Fiction and low-budget horror flicks. uh, Blood Simple reinvented the film noir for a new generation marking the arrival of a filmmaker, a filmmaking ensemble that would transform the American independent scene. Uh, well said. Yeah, I agree with all that. Um, yeah, I hadn't seen this movie in a few years. This uh, Blu-ray transfer looks great. It's another restored 4K digital transfer approved by Barry Sonnenfeld and Joel and Ethan Cohen. Um, yeah, great stuff. Um, just a really wonderful, twisty neo-noir story. You have Dan Hedaya, a great villain. He owns this bar. He's either dating or married to, I can't remember if they're married or not, uh, Abby, who's played by Frances McDormand. And I didn't fully realize this was her first film role, but it was. And, um, and she was cast in part because she was friends with Holly Hunter, who they had interviewed and wanted for this part, but she was unavailable because she had a Broadway show. Of course, they would use her later in Raising Arizona, and I think she's on an answering machine message. I swear I heard her voice in this movie. But anyway, she told Frances McDormand to audition, and she did, and she got it, and she's great in it. And uh, so the main characters are basically Dan Adea, who owns the bar, Abby, uh, Ray, played by John Getz, who is working at the bar, bartender, I guess, and 
he and Francis McDormand sort of hit it off and start up a little affair. And Dan Hedaya was, has already been suspicious of, of Abby. So he's hired this private detective played by M.M. Walsh, who the part was written for. The Coens actually saw him in straight time, which is a movie I love. Uh, we have a Blu-ray on that now. Yes. Um, but, uh, he is this really wonderful scummy parole officer in that movie. And so they wrote this private detective with him in mind. They offered it to him. He accepted. He wanted to be paid in cash. There's an interview with him on here. That's pretty funny. Um, so he's following the Abby character around and eventually Dan Dea, once he discovers they're having an affair, he wants the private eye to kill both of them, I guess. And things get very complicated from there. There's a lot of, like I said, some turns that you don't necessarily expect with some people doing things that aren't exactly the way you would expect them to be in a noir like this. So there's a sense of awareness uh, of the genre and the conventions of the genre that they're subverting that I actually really enjoy. Um, and M.M. Walsh is fantastic in this. Like, he's really got this creepy laugh, which they would then bring back in Raising Arizona. And I feel like he's been in a couple of their Coens where he laughs and he's just, I don't know, it's creepy. Um, but it's just a really neat noir story and a wonderful example of what you can do on a lower budget if you're, you know, thinking about uh, how to make the shots interesting. I, I wrote down just like some cool shots from the movie. Like there's a tracking shot down a bar where they go, there's a guy laying on the bar and the camera actually goes up and over him and just kind of goes to the two people talking at the end of the bar. Um, there's a tracking shot with the dog walking down a hallway. There's a shaky cam shot and shaky cam. I I heard, um, Sam, uh, I, I heard the Coens talk about working on evil dead. Um, and Sam Raimi and how Sam Raimi had this, this idea of the shaky cam, which is a two by five, four board with an operator on either side and the camera mounted in the middle and you can carry it like a steady cam and move. It's not a steady cam cause obviously it's a, it's shaky, but you can f- fly the camera in, uh, and, and gives this great sense of like, I don't know, creepy urgency, uh, unsettling, whatever. Um, so there's a great shot of two people on a, coming out of a house standing on the lawn and the, the camera comes, shaky cam comes up to their faces and it's a really cool shot. It's straight out of like Evil Dead. They stole that or they, Sam says it really nicely in the documentary I saw. He's like, they have applied this like any other craftsman would, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a crane up to an overhead shot where we see a dead character silhouetted, uh, it's dead character above them and the silhouettes of the ceiling fan just flipping by. And then there's a dark room, this is one of my favorites, that starts getting flooded with shafts of light when bullet holes penetrate the walls. And in the same interview, or I'm sorry, documentary, um, it was American Cinema. There's this PBS series called American Cinema hosted by uh, John Lithgow. And they had a whole, they have a bunch of episodes. There's a Movie Brats one, which is great, all about the 70s, Scorsese and all that group. And then there's the American Independent stuff where they're talking to Jarmusch and to Spike Lee and to, um, to the Coens and they interviewed Joel Silver and he's, you know, obviously a big Hollywood producer. And he said he was so impressed and obviously he would go on to work with the Coen brothers. He produced Hudsucker Proxy, for example. Um, but there, he was so impressed by this shot with these shafts of light. He's like, I make a lot of these action movies and I never thought to do these shafts of light. And it is a really great thing. And it's actually kind of surprising. You haven't seen more of it. You know, it's just a, somebody should steal it. It's a really good thing. And the way they do it in the movie is awesome. Um, so anyway, lots of great shots. The film also has really good sound design. Uh, like there's like a scene where a bug zapper is sort of periodically zapping during this really tense scene. Uh, there's a great sound of a metal shovel being dragged across asphalt. Um, there's a scene where a screen door gets smacked by something. I'm not going to spoil that. And it also has a very simple piano score that has something very subtly sinister about it. It's Carter Burwell's first score, and he did a great job. Also, bonus, they have a German Shepherd in the movie, and I have a German Shepherd, so I kind of 
Love that stuff. Um, in terms of the features, again, this transfer looks great. The features, I think, are all <clears throat> from the free previous Blu-ray, but they're really good. Uh, they're broken up into three se sections on the supplements menus. You have <clears throat> filmmakers, actors, and sound and music. Under the filmmakers tab, we have two things. We have Shooting Blood Simple, which is really cool almost basically a commentary. It's not quite the whole movie, but it's most of the movie because it's an hour and 10 minutes. Joel and Ethan Cohen, they obviously, they got Barry Sonnenfeld to shoot the movie, um, which I said is his first 35 feature. And this is a select scene discussion where the three of them, three of them are set down with telestrators, which are basically like, I don't know if they're like iPads, but you can draw on them little lines and so we're watching the screen and any one of those three guys can draw and circle things I actually kind of wish they did more commentaries like this um so they watch most of the movie and they'll give little comments and they'll draw little circles around things and it's pretty entertaining as a commentary anyway but having the extra element of the telestrators is kind of cool so that's one thing under filmmakers and then we have a conversation with dave eggers which is 35 minutes dave eggers is the author who did a heartbreaking work of staggering genius a hologram for the king. He's a screenwriter. He did Where the Wild Things Are. And of course, he's the founder of the McSweeney's Publishing. Uh, and he sat down with Joel and Ethan in May of 2016, which is, I think, when the Blu-ray came out. Um, and they discuss the, you know, the, the, their debut film, Blood Simple, from its initial inspiration and their efforts to get it, the production off the ground, the complicated process of finding a distributor. Um, and they... Ex they sort of really revel in this exhilarating experience that they had. And they have tons of great stories about every aspect of the production, you know, casting, uh, all kinds of things. And it's a really, really cool chat. I really dig that. So under the actors tab, then we have, uh, two interviews. We have Frances McDormand, uh, 25 minutes. This is also from 2016. She talks about auditioning. She talks about, um, just insights into the Coen brothers, creative process and the many ways the film changed her life both personally and professionally really neat chat with her I'm a big fan of hers then you have M. Emmett Walsh himself is interviewed for about 16 and a half minutes um, and you know he goes into his own personal history with acting a little bit and then he talks about straight time and how he tried to play that character actually like a nice guy like based on his own dad who worked with in customs I guess and people trying to trick you and stuff like that. And so he really was trying to play him like a nice guy, but he comes off like a very terrible person in straight time. But I love that story. And then he goes into his memories of the, you know, production and when you get paid in cash and then realizing that was kind of a mistake because he's got to carry all this cash around with him. Um, so really fun interview with him. And then under the sound and music tab, we have one interview and it's two, it's a two-pronged because it's Carter Bur Burwell and Skip uh, Livesey. Uh, Carter Burwell, the composer, Skip Livesey, uh, sound designer, sound editor, and they both started on Blood Simple and, with the Coens, and they've continued to collaborate ever since then. So they sort of reflect on their early work together and discuss the Coens' approach to music and sound design, and it's really, really great. The whole package of this disc is, again, disc of the year material, I know we've already had this Blu-ray, and so in effect, I'm kind of awarding a, a disc that's already been out, but the 4K upgrade, I think, makes it worth it, and sort of an absolute must, along with Lone Star. The two, for me so far, must-haves from Criterion uh, for this year. So anyway, thank you so much for listening, and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.